<laughs> well, kind of a weird sound for a headstone to be making, right? Well, this is what's known as a zinker, and it is just the first of seven cool things that I wanna show you in this video. Stuff that you can keep an eye out for the next time you're taking a stroll through an old cemetery. But hey, let's start with our zinker here. So, what exactly is a zinker? Well, as the name might imply, a zinker is a special type of grave monument that is made almost entirely out of zinc. Marketed as white bronze back in the late 1800s, these things were sold like all across the United States as cheap alternatives to traditional stone monuments. Although they were relatively popular for a short amount of time, they pretty much fell entirely out of favor as the 1900s rolled around and now they just kind of sit all across the country as little reminders of how quickly trends can come and go. And you know, uh, reading through old ads for Zinkers is a real treat. It is very obvious just how hard they were trying to push these things as like objectively superior to a regular tombstone. Better and cheaper than any stone. Endorsed by scientists as pr practically indestructible. White bronze is not porous. Stone is. White bronze has no fissures. Stone has. White bronze will not crack. Stone will. Another cool uh, zinker feature is the interchangeable panels built into the sides. These can all be unscrewed and replaced in case you wanna change an inscription or like add the name of another person to the monument or something along those lines. And pretty much all zinkers have these panels because pretty much all zinkers were made by exactly one company based out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Just one company riding a very short-lived fad for a few decades, making about a bajillion different zinc monuments in all different shapes and sizes and leaving their very distinctive mark on the world. Because once you know what to look for, zincers absolutely stick out like a sore thumb. You'll be able to spot their bluish gray tint from a mile away. All right, let's move on from the big and the obvious to something a little harder to notice. Field stones. Basically, field stones are uncut rocks deliberately set to mark the location of unmarked graves. This was oftentimes how the poor and the enslaved and, you know, those without family were buried way back in the day. No name, no nothing. Just a regular old rock stuck at an angle in the earth. These are especially exciting to notice in very old and very run-down cemeteries because it might take a little work to find them, but they're there. The last memory of a name and a person long forgotten. Always worth thinking about for a second. Here's one that's really only applicable to smaller old cemeteries that haven't really seen much upkeep. See how there's like a divot in the ground here with a couple of small raised piles of dirt on either side? Well, this is a classic sign that a body might have been dug up and moved out of the cemetery many years ago. This was and still is a relatively common practice. It's, it's most often done because the family of the deceased wants to change cemeteries for whatever reason. If you ever see something like this, I always recommend poking around the perimeter of the cemetery because you just might find the old headstone laying around somewhere by the wall. This next one is just a little PSA. The vast majority of these like above ground stone tomb monuments do not have bodies inside them. That's just a common misconception. It would be way too risky to like stick a body in something like this because as soon as the stone broke or cracked, it, it just, it would not be a pretty picture. Hey, next time you're in a cemetery, uh, pay a little attention to the weathering and the damage on the headstones. It can be very fun to try and like figure out how a particular crack or discoloration on a headstone came to be. Sometimes it can be obvious, like how these headstones have clearly been broken into pieces and then repaired, but then sometimes you gotta think about it a little more. Like look at these two nearly identical headstones from the same time period. Why is the bottom half of the one on the right so much lighter. It's hard to say for sure, but my best guess is that the right hand stone was like partially buried for a long time. And then eventually some like kind person came around to do a little cemetery revitalization and they dug it up and reset it back where it's supposed to be. And that's why the bottom half has so much less weathering on it. All right, so this next one is definitely more specific to the Northeast, but it is way too cool to leave out of the video. 
So check out the size of the trees in this forest here. They're big and they're relatively old, but you know, nothing too crazy, right? And then boom, huge, gigantic white pine towering over the rest of the forest. There are absolutely no other trees anywhere near this cemetery that are even close to this size. And there's a good reason for that. You see, up until the last like a hundred years or so, New England was almost entirely pasture land. Most old growth forests in lower New England were like completely cleared for both timber and to make room for livestock. Pretty much any and every big tree down here was in danger of getting cut down back in the day, with the exception of decorative trees planted in old cemeteries. I mean, nobody is gonna go chop down a white pine that was planted to honor a grave site, right? And so as time passed and all the other trees got cut down, the cemetery trees just kept on growing. A lot of the biggest trees you will ever see are in these tiny little rural cemeteries. And now I wanna close things up with a pretty crazy little feature of cemetery history that will literally change the way you see graveyards forever. Did you know that back during the first few decades of the 1900s, one of the biggest manufacturers of headstones in the country was Sears? <laughs> yeah, the department store. Along with their general catalog, Sears actually released a yearly listing of headstones that you could order by mail. They came in all sorts of different sizes and shipped all over the country for relatively cheap prices. And so as a result, there are Sears headstones literally everywhere. In fact, it would not surprise me at all if some of you recognized a few of these designs. They are extremely common. But Sears had a whole bunch of like specialty monuments too, like really unique stones that are a real treat to spot today. Like this cylinder one that's lying on its side here. Sears called this the low roll, but most people nowadays refer to them as bolsters. Or how about this? These are super cool. See how this headstone looks like it's only like half carved, like the stone worker just quit in the middle of the job? Well, that's actually an intentional design called an emerging stone. These were intended to be used for people who unfortunately died on the young side of life. The unfinished stone is supposed to mirror the unfinished life that it stands for. But like I said, most of the Sears headstones are pretty standard. It can be super fun to flip through one of these catalogs and realize that you recognize pretty much all of these styles. I do gotta warn you though, once you learn to recognize a Sears headstone, you will literally never unsee them again. Every time you go in a cemetery for the rest of your life, for as long as you live, you'll be seeing them. Except for maybe this tree stump one. That one's pretty hard to find.